movie about perfect society where everybody drinks all the time. Scene. Upper class man in a beautiful flat. Acquaintances ring the doorbell. He invites them for a drink. Says he has had four or five already. Doesn't seem drunk. Everyone laughs nicely. They have half liter beers. Someone asks about the wife. The upper class man says that she's been drinking vodka because they have so much vodka at home and must finish it before they buy new stuff. She's taking a nap. Other man says he is usually has a small shot of vodka before he's going to sleep. They talk about balance in life. Other man's wife leans in and asks in a sweet fashion what time it is. Other man asks his glasses what time it is. He has to pick up the kids from school. Him and his wife scull the beer and upper class man says that they ha don't have to finish the beers. Other man says in a very casual but serious manner that one should not waste alcohol. Nobody laughs. Everybody understands. Scene. Kids meet up. One is wearing the full pink Juventus kit. Everyone looks at him. He says he had to tell his parents something. The other kids are surprised that he doesn't, hasn't told his parents. He says, his dad says that when his society makes it legal for minors to drink, he will be allowed to drink. The other kid says that his dad probably was drinking before he was of legal age. He says that his dad says that he didn't drink and that he's happy about that to this day. All the kids go to a semi-padded semi room where a lady asks them to sign a paper. She prominently says that information cannot be shared unless someone disappears. A social worker serves them drinks. There are some kids dancing with headphones. There are some kids kissing. Scene. High strung liberal open office space. Two guys at one end, one at the other end. Laptops and glasses. The two guys drinking white wine spritzers. One of the two guys says that the conservative clients desperately want to appeal to young people. The other says that it's difficult for him to do that if he's not allowed to use uh, risk or sex. The first one answers that when the companies say that, they only mean that he is not allowed to do it overtly. The second guy says that it is hard to interpret a pitch that wants something but doesn't want it. The first says that the second is welcome to the business. Long silence. Both drink. Guy across the room puts on music. The first guy says that the guy across the room is a legend because it's 9.30 in the morning and he's already knocking down vodka. The second guy asks if the, if the first thinks the guy across the room is an alcoholic. The first one says no and that even if he wasn't... Uh, if the guy across the room was an alcoholic, his, he does his job well. The second says that if the guy across the room is an alcoholic, imagine how amazing the guy across the room would be if he wasn't an alcoholic. Paris. Autumn leaves are falling down and a, he, and a man is walking around not knowing what to do. He feels as if his whole life should have prepared him for this situation. And he knows that he is the same as everyone else so it would be tactless to complain. He knows that people would probably tell him to find something to do and that the real solution to his problem cannot come from the outside because it takes inner strength. He thinks about it. He thinks about how it is not a mistake by his parents and how he can't blame them. He goes to Herod's. He walks around there for a while. He goes to Paris and walks around there for a week. He buys a camera to start a project where he tells people about his feelings and hopes that people will identify with what he is saying. Sometimes the people say they identify. It makes him feel like he is on the right track. 
Some people say, say that walking around with nothing to do is a luxury that very few people can afford. He feels that they are missing the point because in a sense everyone is walking around without anything to do. A lot of people suggest that the only way to deal with this problem is, is facing it head on by getting rid of most of his possessions and reducing earthly pleasures to an unbearable level. He understands the logic of their argument and the people testifying that the method works seem legitimate. He donates everything he owns except the things he deems essential. A tatami mat, sleeping mat, a toothbrush, a bowl, a spoon, an electric stove, a small fridge, a pillow, a phone, two identical sets of clothing, a winter coat, a cup, a house, a computer, a pair of shoes, a picture of his mom and dad, a Harvard diploma, a passport, a driver's license, a wallet, a bank card, a pot, a lamp, a plant, a candle, a vase, a painting, and a guitar. He doesn't go out much. He systematically gives two-thirds of his salary to charity. He lives in harmony with the seasons and learns how to endure the cold of winter without heating and the heat of summer without air conditioning. He walks to anything that is below 20 kilometers from his house. He only has sex when he feels like it could console the other person. He grows an aura that he can't see himself but other people testify to. He leaves the city to live alone, sustaining himself on his YouTube channel and other donations. Five, year later, five years later, he th thinks about that his relationship to possessions and substances is essentially the same as what he perceived to be the opposite relationship to those things. He thinks about his loneliness as not real loneliness because it stems from an ideological symbolic meaning of loneliness that looks the same as monastic loneliness of Zen monks or great thinkers but really is more of a set of imposed circumstances than the true representation of his inner state. Just like his abstinence from drugs and other earthly pleasures is not the true absence of them in his mind, and, but more a simple-minded negation of his previous position. Five years in the country is five years in the city. He feels love for people and indifference to their actions and the general faith of the world. He shuts down his YouTube channel. He starts drinking moderately and occasionally doing cocaine. He never sends money to charity anymore. A man walks into McDonald's. A man walks into McDonald's and asks the person if she feels that. A man walks into McDonald's and asks the person that works there if she feels that she is really living or if she what she is doing is surviving for the prospect of a possible future. She says that she doesn't know. The man says that she should say what she really feels. She says that it is none of his business and that she really doesn't know. The man asks if she eats the food at McDonald's. She asks if he wants to speak to a manager. The man says no. She says that she is going to have him speak to a manager anyway. He asks if the manager is there now. She says one second. She calls for the manager. The manager asks what she can do for her. She says that the man is asking questions. The manager asks what questions. The man asks the manager if the girl that is working there eats the food at McDonald's. The manager says that prices for employees are the same as for customers and that all employees get a lunch break on which they can choose themselves to eat something that they brought or buy something from the menu. The man asks which of the options the majority of the employees choose to do. The manager says it's different. The girl says that she normally doesn't eat the food at work. The, true man the manager asks what the ma man is doing and what it is for. The man says that he isn't doing anything in particular and wonders what the manager thinks he is doing. 
The manager says that the questions seemed crafted and that it seemed like the typical questions that an investigative journalist would make. The man says that it is funny that she noticed because he is in fact a journalist, although he isn't working at this very moment. The manager asks why he is asking the questions then. The man say, says he is a sports journalist and that he was just curious as to if people that work at McDonald's eat, eat at McDonald's. The manager asks if asks the man if the sports journal if sports journalists eat at McDonald's. The man says yes. The girl says that the man had all had also asked if she feels like she is really living or surviving for the prospect of a possible future. The manager says that that is an angled question and that the workers at McDonald's constantly find this type of prejudice that stems from the wrongful assumption that working at McDonald's is a dead-end job. The girl says that she thinks everyone working at McDonald's know about the status of their, that their job implies and that she obviously doesn't want to work at McDonald's for the rest of her life but honestly has trouble finding out the next step trouble figuring out a next step with things being what they are. The manager says okay as if the conversation is over. The girl says that in the meantime she is happy at McDonald's. The man says that she seems insightful and that he is sure that things will go well for her in the future. The girl says that she hopes so. The manager says that she is sure as well. The man says that he will leave soon but that it would be nice to it was nice meeting them and both meeting them the man says that he will leave soon, but that it was nice meeting them both and that it would be nice to have a proper introduction. The manager shakes his hand and says her name and that she is the manager there at McDonald's. The man says his name. The girl points to her name tag and shakes his hand. The man says that it was really nice to meet them. The manager says any time. The girl waves. The man waves and walks out. The girl asks the manager if she thinks that the man was on drugs. The manager says that he had probably just had beers with his office buddies and was feeling lonely. The man is walking down the side of the sidewalk saying to himself that he doesn't think his loneliness is a problem to him as if subconsciously answering the question the girl asked after he left McDonald's.